one of the things I think is beautiful about biology is the sort of differences in link scales and the differences in time scales. We need to think about proteins at an angstrom level. We're talking about really, really, really small stuff. And then we need to think about our bodies at a meter level. The sort of spatial orders of magnitude that you've got to consider um, you know, are like dozens of orders of magnitude different. Same is true on time. From chemical reactions occurring in a splinter of a second to evolution shaping species over billions of years, the processes that make up our biology occur in time frames both short and long. My name is Ian Cheeseman. I'm a member of the Whitehead Institute and a professor of biology at MIT. We have an assumption that one gene within our cell typically makes one protein, one version of that. I think it's actually much more complex than that. And so the recent work from our lab is really exploring the diversity of protein products created from a single piece of information. I think what always impresses me about um, cells is, is how robust those processes are. They're structured in a way that they're actually quite resilient in the face of um, you know, really dramatic insults and change. Some of the everyday tasks happening within a cell occur really fast. Proteins can undergo changes in their shape in milliseconds. Channels embedded in the cell membrane open and close to control the flow of ions entering and exiting a cell, an adjustment crucial to making muscles contract. In fact, at this microscopic level, many processes happen at an incredible clip. DNA polymerase produces new DNA using an existing template at 1,000 base pairs per second. Translation from RNA to protein product also happens on an order of seconds. Most proteins are degraded and replaced within hours, days, or months. Some are strange exceptions, like the crystallines found in our eyes that stick around for decades. The cell orchestrates these many minute adjustments which add up over time, changing the course of an organism's development, how they age. These processes happening over milliseconds are intimately intertwined with even longer timescales. They are a product of evolution and they continue to shape evolution. In order to answer some of the most important questions in biology, researchers must consider how these vastly different timescales interact. Let's continue on this journey examining how biology happens at different lengths of time. Along the way, we will hear from Whitehead Institute scientists on how their thinking about different timescales informs scientific discovery. The cell cycle is this like sweet spot in between these sort of times that we talk to there, right? So in a mammalian cell, it usually takes about 24 hours to go from one cell to having two cells because there's so many things you need to achieve. It's all this combination of really rapid events that need to be happening. You've got to decide that you want to enter mitosis or you want to segregate your chromosomes. Those are choices that the cell is making over minutes, right? And within that, to be able to fine tune those, you know, you, you have to be able to adjust the protein function over seconds and maybe even milliseconds. We have around 30 trillion cells. Today in our bodies, about 50 billion cells are going to divide. And so there's that 24-hour process happening just to keep our bodies in good working order. And so one of the ways that we managed to live for decades is that we're having that constant renewal of our cells. We're just thinking about the ways in which the cells in our body are, are um, both functioning so rapidly, but over this really extended time scale is, is kind of really exciting to, to think about. What's beyond a single cell division? Of course, we aren't just one cell, we're made up of trillions. We did, however, originate from a single cell called a zygote that had to divide many, many times in order to form a complex organism such as ourselves. Similar to tracing a family genealogy, scientists in Whitehead Institute member Jonathan Weissman's lab are tracing cell lineages. I would say that lineage is kind of a tool we can use to study how things came to be the way they are. If you think about all the animals that we have on Earth, we want to understand how they became the way they are. So to do that, what people have been able to do is you look at all the mutations they pick up over time, and that's how we get these beautiful phylogenies of how whales and horses and bugs and all these things are related to one another. The same logic can be applied to studying generations of dividing cells. I'm Luke Koblen. I'm a postdoc in Jonathan Weissman's lab, and I've been here for around three years working on lineage tracing. 
Lineage tracing enables scientists to construct a family tree of dividing cells. It's a way of peering into the past, witnessing the ways that cells transform over time, which determines the course of development and, when things go wrong, the course of aging or cancer. What we do is we make systems to label cells over time with these kind of little tags that allow us to say how cells are related and to build these trees, hopefully relating every cell in the tumor or the organism um, to one another. We could try and study how all the cells in a primary tumor came to be. And then we can see how that evolutionary process gave them the ability to metastasize to a different place in the body. We have a chance to try and pick apart when and how those characteristics emerged in these populations of cells. An evolutionary perspective can reveal surprising complexities. The value of looking at lineage is if you just were kind of looking at traits of a cell, you might say, oh, obviously these two cells look very similar, but they're, you know, actually came from very different places or got there from very different ways. You could imagine studying development, which I think is kind of an ultimate application case for these kinds of tools of like, you start with a cell and then you end up with a complex organism. You can make this beautiful map of how development normally happens or the kind of statistics behind how choices are made throughout that process. Within an organism's lifespan, everyday functions orchestrate momentous changes that are not only happening over hours or days, but often over months and even years. My lab studies how animals adapt to uh, extreme environments and survive for long periods of time um, through entering states of torpor and hibernation. I'm Sini Shaharwatin. I'm a member of the Whitehead Institute and assistant professor of biology at MIT. For decades, it's been known that hibernators live longer than closely related non-hibernating species, but it's been very difficult to figure out what is behind that, what are the mechanisms behind that. We wanted to tackle this question by taking advantage of the tools that we built to synthetically induce a hibernation-like state in mice. We found that uh, certain tissues like the blood actually slow down features of aging and that the whole animal actually appears to be somewhat less physically aged. It turns out that the key, at least for the blood epigenetic aging effect, was actually a decrease in temperature. Uh, we're not talking about, you know, the turnover uh, that's happening at a second, at a minute, at an hour, even the day rate. We're talking about an animal uh, predicting that in three months' time it's going to be deep in the winter. We have these hibernating hamsters and usually they're in normal light-dark cycle, like 12 hours light, 12 hours dark. So they think it's like it's spring or it's early fall. Uh, but then when you shift them into more darkness than light, that initiates a cue in their brain that, oh, winter is coming. It takes them, for some reason, about three months or so of being in this state in order to become competent to hibernate. When they start hibernating, we keep the environments the same. It's cold in the room, it's primarily dark, and somehow about two and a half or so months into hibernation, they just completely stop hibernating and they come out as if they counted how long a winter should have taken. The HIVAR team lab is in search of key sets of neurons in the brain, which are responsible for inducing hibernation and awakening animals from this low energy state. It's known that there's actually quite a few ch seasonal changes even in us humans. All of us as organisms on Earth are largely used to, in, in moderate climates, seasonal changes and have evolved to work with them, but we don't completely understand the mechanisms that regulate those. Biology doesn't stop at the end of a single organism's lifespan. Whitehead Institute member Yukiko Yamashita studies germ cells, which carry genetic information through generations, perpetuating life on Earth and passing along genetic changes that drive evolution. If you just think about it, um, you know, you and I have been just two germ cells a few to several decades earlier, which came from our biological parents, who also used to be just two germ cells a few decades earlier. That came from their parents, your grandparents, uh, who you know used to be also just two germ cells <laughs> a few decades earlier. We can just keep this, you know, the uh, the cycle of the life. But then, what connected between those generations? They're always germ cells. And then this cycle essentially truck backs 
1.5 billion years. I'm Yukiko Yamashita. I'm a member at the Whitehead Institute as well as a professor at the MIT uh, Biology Department. I study germ cell, their development, their implication in uh, you know, evolution of the species. When we talk about our genome, which is our DNA, not all DNAs are equally you know, the robust. In a certain region of the DNA is particularly more sensitive to uh, damage or uh, have a higher tendency to erode over time. And how those elements can be maintained against this, you know, the evolutionary time scale billion years, it's a really big part of the germline immortality. One such vulnerable genetic element is ribosomal DNA, a highly repetitive stretch of our genome that encodes for ribosomes, the cellular machines that produce proteins. Recent work in the Yamashita lab shows that asymmetric cell division in germline stem cells helps maintain ribosomal DNA across generations. It's one of the many crucial processes that allow our genetic material to be passed down generations indefinitely. I mean, often case researchers uh, utilize, you know, evolutionary conservation or, um, you know, they use the idea that all organisms came from this common ancestor. And sometimes we use that conservation as a hint that that gene is very important or lack of conservation might mean that they are evolving fast for very specialized reasons. Any DNA changes that have an evolutionary impact happens in the germ cells. We cannot think about evolution at all without thinking about the germ cells. The biggest inherent challenge is that we cannot repeat the evolution. In the experimental setting, we need another 1.5 billion years <laughs> to be able to expand, experimentally prove what happened. And of course, we also even believe that, you know, the course of evolution is pretty much stochastic. Everything has to happen in a germ cell to cause the evolution. So studying germ cells is almost like studying the course of the evolution. Researchers at Whitehead Institute continue to explore how different biological timescales influence each other in intricate ways. It's a way of both understanding and appreciating the interconnectedness of life.